this week on the Back Table Podcast. For me personally, if I'm doing a diverticular abscess, most of the time it's the hospitalist or the surgeon calling me for about a two centimeter diverticular abscess. And I'm not going to put anything big in that at all, or maybe nothing. Usually I'll start a little smaller for some reason. I don't know why. Usually it's probably just the approach and there's not a real good window. If there's a good window and I know it's going to be an abscess, like in a diverticular abscess, I'll usually go like 10, 12 French right off the bat. And if I go with ultrasound, I could definitely see some echogenicity, inoculations, septations, et cetera. If I know that too, I'll usually go a little bit bigger. For like you, I think you mentioned bile, biloma, very similar, similar approach to the whole thing. If I can do ultrasound and CT, I like to watch everything under ultrasound. And in fact, I was trying to progress this whole thing of doing a lot of stuff under ultrasound where you can actually see the needle go in, you can see the wire go in, you can pretty much do the whole entire thing under ultrasound. And I like to just pop a CT image just right at the end so my surgeons can look and they're like, oh, okay, it's in there, you know, because they won't <laughs> believe you. Welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your source for all things endovascular or otherwise minimally invasive. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or backtable.com. Subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, or reach out to us on Twitter or email to let us know how we can make this a more valuable resource for the endovascular community. Now a quick word from our sponsor. At Medtronic, they take deep venous disease and patients' quality of life seriously. That's why they've committed to help you treat patients with the Abre Venous Self-Expanding Stent System. Risks include pain, myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolus, and re of the stented segment. Learn more at www.medtronic.com forward slash Aubrey Venus. And now back to the show. This is Michael Barraza is one of your hosts. I have a co-host today, my friend Aaron Fritz. Hey, Aaron. Hey, thanks for having me. Today, uh, we're going to talk about kind of a niche topic, an up and coming thing that some of our listeners have probably heard of. It's kind of new. It's called abscess drains. Very hot right now. And I'm <laughs> honored to be joined by Dr. John is it Pavlis or Pavlis? Am I saying that right? It's Pavlis and, and the honor is all mine. Thank you so much for, for having me today. We're uh, excited to have you on. John is the uh, CEO and CMO of Oink Medical Group, which has M3TA Health and Healthy's NFT. Is that correct? Yeah, it's, I, I basically have a combination of two things going on where I'm trying to explore different medical device ideas and then also putting healthcare on the blockchain. I love it. Where are you living right now? Texas. Yeehaw. Texas. Where are you working? So I work in San Antonio. Been there for about four years. Right now I'm doing a little work in Corpus. I like it, man. Yeah. Well, look, tell us a little bit about why we chose you and asked you to come on and talk to us about drains. I know this is a personal interest of yours. Yeah. I would say that it's become a fascination and kind of the topic that I didn't want to get into, but it came to me. It became an issue when I just noticed that everyone was doing completely different things about drainage and no one had a straight answer about any single one thing regarding drainage. <laughs> so I became fascinated with it just straight up from the aspect of how you characterize fluid, when you drain it, how long you drain it, when you check it, when you remove it, what you look for, outcomes, and even the suture that you <laughs> drain with, you know? And and Michael and I were even talking about this the other day, especially like for with the suspected fistula, like JP drain with suction or just to a bag, right? We're yeah, going to get to that, Aaron. Yes, Don't you spoil the I fun. Know, I know. Sorry, sorry. So look, man, like it's maybe not the most glamorous topic in the world. And there are a lot of people out there that like to shit on drains and say it's a trash case. But like, it's not my favorite thing in the world, but I, I think that it's an important thing. And I, I really do believe there is a gradient of how well people can do drains. And I got to tell you guys, you're, you're talking to a pro. It's one of my great skills <laughs> is doing drains. And, and sometimes they suck. And sometimes you get one of those drains that you smell on you for like the rest of the day. I know you guys have had one where, you know, you'll be sitting at home, you'll open something to drink and you'll smell it and you just got to throw it out. Mm hmm delicious or it leaked on your shoes you know when, when you were dilating it's like the feet rose <laughs> yeah. thing you know you look at your shoes if you don't have bile and pus and blood on it then you didn't have a good day of work you know that's totally right well you know one of the things that's changed for me is, you know, i remember when i was a surgery intern i remember like one of like 
the case that really stood out to me was a case where I had to throw my clothes away after. It was this guy with this absolutely massive abscess on his back. And when I tell you massive, I mean like pregnant woman's belly massive on his back. And so they're like, all right, you know, Barraza, you are going to get to do this case in the OR. And I, I took the scalpel and I made the incision and just my jaw dropped like, dude, suction it out. It's like squirting everywhere. Now the difference is is where I am. No one really does INDs except the ortho guys. You know, the ones that they sent me to do as an intern to do on the floor, they now just ask us like, hey, can you put in a 20 centimeter drain for this subcutaneous fluid collection? Right. And, and we're suckers. Because you so need image guidance. You say yes. Because yeah, you need you it. Got it. It's right there, yeah, but you, you just need it's, it. It's, there's a huge <laughs> mound of pus, but you never know. You, there, there's, there could be anything under there. <laughs> so, John, tell me some of the things that you noticed that were different from one place to the next in terms of doing drains. I've noticed the same thing going between different jobs, how differently drains are done. Yeah. I mean, let's just start from training, you know, from residency to fellowship to being an attending and going to my place of work for the first time. I mean, it differs just drastically on who even places the drains. So you can have a body fellowship where they are only doing the drains and you're doing high-end work in your fellowship and you're not doing a lot of this stuff. You could be having just the diagnostic radiologist who's at your place doing a lot of this stuff and you say, I'm, I'm IR, I'm, I'm too good for this. I need my high-end, <laughs> you know, beautiful procedures Y90. to do. Yeah, my, 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 my Y90s and my embolizations and my legs and everything. <laughs> when I got to my first gig as a brand new attending, they started to ask me to drain a whole bunch of hematomas and in fellowship at Georgetown, they were like, ah, we don't do hematomas. You know, we're not going to infect a hematoma. Why would we Hell place, no. right? Why would we place a drain in a serial collection and cause an infection? This is ridiculous. Call a surgeon. So they kept consulting me over hematomas. I kept, no, 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 no. Eventually I, I buckled because that was my practice and I started doing that and it was annoying because then I would place eight French, a 10 French, maybe even a 12 French and nothing would happen, <laughs> right? And the drain would be in place. The surgeons would complain. Nothing was going on. And you just keep imaging the patient. So that started my whole journey. I'm like, this is kind of crazy. Like, what do we do here? You know, not to mention the TPA thing. All of a sudden people were using TPA and drains at my new place. And I was like, that's crazy. But it's done. And uh, it's done in different places. It's done in different cavities. It's done in different collections. So it was a journey from that standpoint, noticing that there was such wide variability about what radiologist does what image guided drainage procedure and what are the indications and what drains to use, how to use them. Totally. And how to do them. You know, I mean, yeah. at, at each spot, everybody's different for how they're doing them, what they're willing to do and, you know, what they're willing to use, including image guidance, ultrasound versus CT. And in one of my jobs, there was this arbitrary rule that if it was done with ultrasound, you didn't get sedation. But if you did it with CT, well, then we can sedate those patients, you know, because that radiation, man, that shit hurts. And I guess you have to sedate for that. <laughs> It's the, it's the cat uh, and the cat scan. You know, you got to sedate yourself for that. And then, you know, in my current job, when I started, I would try to do a drain with ultrasound and fluoro, like on an IR table. And they look at me like, are you crazy? No one has ever done this before. I'm like, well, what did you do for gallbladder drains? Like, oh, yeah, we do most of those in CT. Um, oh, a hundred, a hundred percent. You know, I go to some locums places and I ask for ultrasound and they go, what? It's not a CT yeah. guided drain. And I go, no, it's ultrasound. It's right there. I can see it super easy in real time. They're like, that's crazy. I'm going to go, is it? You know, it's, it's, it's <laughs> I mean, same with chest tubes, right? Yeah. I just did a chest tube the other day. Like you could see it clear as day. Like there's no reason to do it in CT when they have a big hemothorax or they have, you know, even an empyema. If you can see it clear as day on ultrasound, like what's the point in scanning them in CT? Yeah. And there are all kinds of other variations like trocar versus needle and wire. Yes. What size drain you start with. You know, I, I have been taught go medium or go home or go big and go home. But I virtually never use an apron strain, but like a lot of places I've gone, like, you know, you ask for like a 12, like, whew, Jesus, like cowboy here. I know, I know. And that's like one of the things, you know, the go big and go home, there's this concept that I'm working on and we could probably talk about it later where my commercialization partners talk about go big and go home, which is a thing that I want to touch on later. I but. love that. Yeah, that's great. Well, why don't we talk through like a standard abscess drain? Let's let's say patient presents with a diverticular abscess, standard belly abscess. 
What is your standard abscess drainage technique, John? So for me personally, if I'm doing a diverticular abscess, most of the time it's the hospitalist or the surgeon calling me for about a two centimeter diverticular abscess. And I'm not going to put anything big in that at all, or maybe nothing. Usually I'll start a little smaller for some reason. I don't know why. Usually it's probably just the approach and there's not a real good window. If there's a good window and I know it's going to be an abscess, like in a diverticular abscess, I'll usually go like 10, 12 French right off the bat. And if I go with ultrasound, I could definitely see some echogenicity, inoculations, septations, et cetera. If I know that too, I'll usually go a little bit bigger. For like you, I think you mentioned bile, biloma, very similar, similar approach to the whole thing. If I can do ultrasound and CT, I like to watch everything under ultrasound. And in fact, I was trying to progress this whole thing of doing a lot of stuff under ultrasound where you can actually see the needle go in, you can see the wire go in, you could pretty much do the whole entire thing under ultrasound. And I like to just pop a CT image just right at the end so my surgeons can look and they're like, oh, okay, it's in there. You know, because they won't believe you <laughs> if you save an no, ultrasound image. So that's actually something I run into. So I, I cover a children's hospital frequently and I'm the only person who likes to use ultrasound in the in the drains over there. It's all to the entire case in ultrasound and so I have to make sure I get like a nice picture at the end, just showing the, the drain in the collection oh, yeah. because they're like, okay, if you say you did it, you did it. I'm like, trust me, there, there's pus coming out of it right now. What's your favorite wire that you use for most abscess drains? Oh, that's a good question. I used to use a wire. One of my attendings, Keith Horton at Washington Hospital Center, loved this Coons wire, but I can't find it anywhere. And I've asked for it a whole bunch of times. <laughs> it's like in between like a Rosen type stiffness and an Amplatz, but I, it's, yeah. It's just, it's like, that sounds perfect. Nice. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. It's like, it's butter. It's perfect. I, I, I just can't, I can't get anywhere. I've asked my lead techs and everyone to get me this wire and they look at me like I'm crazy. They get me the wrong length. No, they got it for crazy. me once. They got me an 038, which doesn't go through some drains. And we should talk about that too. But right now I'm using like short Amplats is, is perfect for me. Yeah. I'm an Amplats guy. I used to be a Rosen guy. And then I started my current job and I'd put in these drains and they had this, this flimsy little J wire and like 15% of the time, you know, if, if you put it in, it'll flop the thing out. And everybody looked at me like it was crazy. It's like, I was the first person to get Amplatz wires in the CT department in this hospital. That's not a crazy thing, right? That's crazy. I've only ever been handed an Amplatz wire. I can't say I've ever even used another type of wire for an abscess drain. Oh, wow. But I think that I'm was, the only like the person standard. who, you know, for an abscess drain routinely use. So the way I do it, needle wire and I do soft tissue dilator and the plastic stiffener. I'm not a metal stiffener guy unless I need to be because I found that it kinks the wires and can flop things out. And so that's that's like what I've taught. You know, we have some of our PAs who work in our department will help with those sometimes. And that's what we're doing now. Are, are you a metal guy, Aaron? Yeah. I mean, even like what if you're going through muscle, like a paraspinal, like let's say wow. it's a psoas abscess. You got to have the metal stiffener I don't know if you know this about me, Aaron, but I'm very strong. <laughs> and so I just push it and it works. All right, man. Kudos to that. I, I like that. only use metal. Yeah. I, I can use metal in like a very large person when I'm doing a nephrostomy. And that's like really yeah. about it. Yeah. I have used well, the I, metal hey, stiffener to reposition, you know, like you, you could use it to back up some stuff if you're yeah, taking yeah, a yeah. brankum on in. and you watch it under flow and you put it right to that, you know, point where it starts to curl on the pig and you just like kind of push it in, your, in the place that you want and leave it alone. Okay. So we talked about standard abscess ranges when you can see under ultrasound, but let's say it's a deep pelvic, like cul-de-sac abscess. You're not going to be able to see that well under ultrasound. What's your technique and what, do, what are the pitfalls of a pelvic abscess like transgluteal? Yeah, and that's just that name in in itself is very frustrating for the proceduralist and also the patient, which is something else I'd, I'd love to talk about too, because I have plenty of patients when you do the transgluteal technique. I believe you really have to talk to them, look at them in the eyes and say, this is going to suck for you. Like it's not comfortable. And I don't think we do that enough. I don't think we set the expectations, but yes. Yeah, so cul-de-sac abscess. Totally agree. If you have a good window, there's always the bowel that could be in the way. The rectum's right there. You have your vessels, your nerves. So you always, the, the textbook answer is to, you know, get the patient prone, look under CT, go as close to the sacrum as you can and go through the sacroiliac ligament. But often, and I'm sure you guys have encountered this, it's never in that perfect spot most of the time. And so you have to kind of go through sometimes through some hard things, it feels hard and it doesn't feel good. 
but yeah, I, I mean, I've even, I've even been curved a needle and steered. If you That's guys cool. have as well, yeah. What kind of needle do you use when you curve? A Hawkins needle. Okay. It, I've definitely tried an angle just a little bit though. Not right? on, I've never done it on purpose. Yeah, just a little bit <laughs> curved because then the wire won't go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, because it's the piriformis muscle, right? That you don't want it because if you go through that, then they're going to feel it like for weeks, right? So I'm just going to say it. They're going to feel it no matter what you do. And I'm really looking for big vascular structures. I'm looking for ureters and I'm looking for bowel. My craniocaudal limit is a little higher, but once it gets up there, like it's, I mean, it's, they're going to be miserable regardless. But for me, I, I guess I'll just say using the pure forms, which we've all been taught, you know, the, the sacred spinous ligament, don't go above that. I haven't found it to be that much worse than, than when I, I go a little bit lower. I think they just all suck. Yeah. Am I oh, yeah. crazy? Oh, sacred spinous I mean, ligament. No. I said sacred like, ligament. I meant sp- sacred spinous yeah, whatever. It's a yeah, yeah. Pelvis. One of those ligaments. One of those crunchy things. in there. But I know I hate them. I hate them always. And they're always bad. And when I was in training and I spent time at CHOP with the kids, they would get these all the time. And we would do transrectal trains with ultrasound. And I got to tell you, the hardest part is, is just kind of explaining to, you know, a teenager that it's like, hey, I'm going to put this probe up your butt and I'm going to drain it this way. But if you can get past that, it's actually like a way more comfortable procedure for them. And it seems like you're putting a drain through the rectum. It seems bad, right? But it, in my limited experience of probably like 10 cases, it was much better tolerated. I tried in my first job out to talk patients into it. They're like, don't even, like, I'd rather you just jam this through my heart. Don't put it through my right. And so I'm, I'm, I haven't done it since. Well, I don't understand how you don't form like a long-term fistula, right? I mean, that's what never made sense to me, but we did it at Vanderbilt. I did some with Bream and- it was like, no, this is how we do it, and it heals up fine. And maybe that's just the thing with kids, and that's why we don't do it in adults. It doesn't heal the same way. But, John, do you have any experience with that? We've definitely considered doing transrectal drains a couple times in a couple cases. And I am lucky in my institution now where I have some very aggressive advanced interventional gastroenterologists. And although they haven't completed the transrectal drainage procedure, they have attempted and tried. They've gone up and looked with ultrasound and everything like that because I've really forced them to say, hey, can you really talk to this patient, see if you can get this because I really don't want to do a transgluteal drain in this patient. They're going to be very uncomfortable for a long time and this will be better. And it hasn't been perfect. And again, this is, I think, the reason why it's so great to have a drain talk is that nothing's really been perfect in approaching these these cases. So, But you know, it's nice to try. I'll tell you one thing I do with them that when I was in residency, it was different in fellowship. When I was in residency, we would put the drain in, hook it up to suction and send them up. And then in fellowship and beyond, you know, what we would do is put the drain in and aspirate everything off on the table. And that is one thing. So, you know, if I'm in a hurry, I might just put a drain in somewhere else, you know, like say it's just like a right upper quadrant drain, you know, put in a drain and hook it up to suction and then send them up. For the transgluteal drains where there's a collection of the pelvis and, and I want them to get this drain out as fast as I can, that's a spot where I will very commonly put the drain in and then just get a bag and a 60cc syringe and aspirate it dry. And then I'll send them up to the floor and I'll call the surgeon or whomever and I'll say, hey, look, if this doesn't put anything out for the next couple of days, let's pull it. And that has been a good approach for those. Yeah, that, I mean, that's a good point when you're talking about, you know, what you do at the time of the procedure as well. And and that's not anything that I don't think any of us have agreed upon either. You know, I'll go to some locums gigs and they don't even have suction bags. Like, you know, some people have accordion attachments to have suction or JP bulbs. They don't even have any of that. They'll just have gravity. And so they'll do full aspiration and washouts at the time of the procedure until it's completely clear or near clear and then hook it up to a gravity bag when you're doing an abscess. Whereas in my place right now, I mean, most of the time we just pop a drain in, get a little bit out maybe for some cultures and gram stain and get a JP on it and let it let it go. I do that a lot because they like to, you know, there certainly is some gratification of when they put their note in the next day. It's like, oh, a drain put out 120 cc's it looks better than like drain put out three cc's would you guys do exactly that's a great point because i'm doing what you're doing michael i'll pull everything out before i hook it up to the jp because i want that satisfaction oh i pulled out 200 cc's of pus 
I'd show a picture of the syringe filled with pus, but that's a great point where they get the satisfaction the next day when it's all, when that JP is filled. Totally. So Aaron, that, you know, you and I wanted to talk about something that I had always wondered. So in different places I've trained and worked, it's been a debate between suction bulbs, JP bulbs, or gravity drainage bags. So when I was in in residency, it was all suction. And then when I went to fellowship, it was all gravity plus sucking that out on my own. And then now it's back to suction. And one thing I have always wondered, John, is, you know, let's say we're talking about diverticular abscess, which is from a small perforation. And you're putting this drain in and you're immediately hooking it up to suction. And I, you know, I have this hypothesis that this is going to either create fistulas or if it, there's a hole there, it's going to keep them open. And I've brought this up to a couple of surgeons and like, just shut up and play the hits. Like, you know, like put the JP bulb on. But what do you think? Yeah. I mean, that's a debate that I constantly hear and nothing has actually been proven. I've actually looked up articles to see if someone somewhere has done some amount of cases to come up with this kind of hypothesis and prove it wrong or right. And it's hard because you're thinking about pressure differences and how fistulas get created. And like Aaron was talking about, you know, I'm surprised how we don't form a fistula when we do the transrectal drain. And in some regards, I've managed fistulas with suction on a JP and backed them out and downsized them. But I've also, I have a mixed bag where I just all of a sudden wake up one morning and go, nope, no suction on this one, you know, and, and totally right. And it's very confusing. It's absolutely very confusing. And one of the parts and the frustrations of doing drain management is this little sprinkle of art and magic and unicorn dust that we put into it and kind of reason through it. And then to be honest with you, I don't know. I have my partners in my practice, they have different theories. Some don't even care. Some surgeons don't care. Some surgeons are adamant about it. They're like, do not put suction on that, right? The fistula is going to keep coming. So the answer is I actually change (laughs) depending on my... No, I think that's reasonable. Look, I mean, it's like crazy thought here. Maybe I don't understand fistulas as well as I thought. I think we were talking about Peter Bream. Peter Bream seems to be a sorcerer of this black magic. I need to ask him what he thinks about yeah, this. he'd be a good person to ask. So let's talk about this. How do you know when you're done? You know, you've got this drain and you know, it, it again, this is very dependent on where I've, I've worked, you know, in, in my last job and where I am now, the standard practice to evaluate a drain that, you know, an abscess that has a drain in it has been to get a CT. Whereas when I was at Penn, we would, for every single drain we placed before it was removed, we would do an abscessogram. The protocol was if it got to below 15 to 20 cc's a day of output, there was no pericatheter leakage and clinically the patient has improved. We would bring the patient down, inject the drain, look for fistula or residual cavity, see if it needed to be exchanged, upsized, or removed. That is, is not a routine part of my practice right now. It's something that I'll do for problem solving. What are you guys doing to assess if a drain needs to be removed, how and and when? This is also differing in practice to practice and within my practice, which makes it very frustrating because we try to standardize this as well. And now that I'm the chief, I try to standardize these things, but you know, everyone wants to practice differently. I really do think that based on the reimbursement, we waste a lot of time doing some of these things too. Ultimately, I've removed drains after doing checks and also CTs, and I've just had to replace them again in the next couple days or weeks to come too. So it becomes really difficult. And I used to be very stringent about it, but I've relaxed myself significantly on it. And I try to save myself time because the practice that I have is pretty high paced. And so, you know, I'll I'll order a CT now if the drainage has gone down and, and if there's no collection there, I'll have them come and we will either depending on what's location, if it's in some kind of eloquent location where I'm a little concerned about yanking on that pigtail, regardless of, you know, releasing that suture, which I hope we talk about some of that too. They could just remove it at bedside. They could come to the pre-op holding or anything like that, and they can remove it by bedside, meaning my residents. So that's kind of where I've gone with this whole practice of follow-up. So what were you going to say about that, about in terms of removing the drain and cutting the pigtail? And before I forget to ask you about it later, yeah, let's talk about it Yeah, now. absolutely. So, you know, that's the thing with removal as well. I would like to touch on on who's removing it. So more than half the time, my patients who are I'm a level one trauma center in, in South Texas, Central Texas, and you know, we get people from all over the place. And a lot of the times my trauma surgeons will follow up on my drains. And I won't even know that they're handling my drains, which is something we need to touch on as well as about follow up and what we're doing for our, our drainage procedures, because kind of it's gonna like, hey, let's set it and then we we will forget it. 
So my surgeons will just go ahead and remove it. Sometimes they'll talk to me and they'll be like, hey, there's no output for three days. Very important. Put a pin in that too. What surgeons think no output is. Anyways, they'll remove it. And I had a couple of times where they actually don't know how to remove these pigtail drains that we place. And mostly when I talk about pigtail drains, it's the locking pigtail drains with the suture lock depending on your your company that you use, but most of them follow the sim- same design. And if we follow this design, that the tip of that catheter as it curls to make the pigtail and you pull the suture from the inside of that lumen, if it loosens up a little bit, basically you have like a string blade that you cut cheese with. So if it's kind of not tight enough and not formed all the way, the tip is not pulled into the drain or towards the drain completely, you basically have a knife. So depending on how it's removed, it can be pretty dangerous. And then also they can leave the suture in too, which I've ser- I'm sure you guys have experienced that before as well. When you cut the drain, I like just, I just transect mine and I pull them that the suture from the suture lock mechanism will be stuck inside the track. So, you know, I, I'm very cautious. And when I get my discharge, I say, call me, I talk to my surgeons, they kind of know in my practice now, but that's something to consider when you're doing locums or anything else. You know, when you place a drain, where does it go and who removes it? Who keeps track of it? Totally. Yeah, I would say the majority of the times I'm not pulling my own drain just because of the nature of the practice. And most of the time it's a surgeon setting them over and they're going to just see the patient in clinic. And it, just like you said, John, like, you know, it varies even guys within the group where some people are adamant about doing a drain check, having their patients come back, they inject under fluoro with contrast, or we have one of our RAs do it and they make a decision whether or not to pull it at that time. That's very nice because you have follow-up, you close the loop, you, the patient sees you, the person who put it in, and you're able to provide continuous care for them. It is less than ideal when the surgeon just sees them in clinic and just decides to pull it based off of what it's been putting out. However, I feel like it's rare that, you know, if the patient's afebrile, it hasn't been putting out and they're not in any pain anymore, it's very rare to have to put that drain back in, right? So I always ask those questions. Yeah, absolutely. And I am in the military. You know, I've been in the Air Force since 2002, and I am a pilot, and we have a pilot culture in the Air Force. And also in the Army, they kind of interject this as well, but this left seat, right seat concept, if you guys fly at all or have heard of this, where, you know, if you're in the right seat, you know, you're training, if you're in the left seat, You know, you're the one in command of the aircraft. And so there's this whole thing where you say, I've got the stick, I got the yoke, I have the drain. And so I make my surgeons, I make my residents talk to the the surgical service as well. And there's this like duplicate communication where it's like, you're managing the drain, I'm managing the drain, right? You're removing the drain, you're following up on the drain, I'm removing the drain, I'm following up on the drain. Because I think it's really important that it's documented and there's some ownership too, where it's like, Ultimately, as we're talking about this, as you can tell, I'm trying to push this practice of standardizing drain care and also making it something where it's like, you know, yeah, it's not that sexy because it's gross and it's simple ish and it's not as great as some of the other awesome procedures we see on Twitter and everything, but really important, right? We did this with IBC filters. We said, hey, we're not following up and we're not paying attention to this. And, you know, we were setting them and forgetting them. I just really think we need to focus a little bit on standardization of follow up with drains and, and all those things. Yep. I agree. It's a challenge and it sometimes takes a lot of manpower. You know, I, I did my fellowship at Penn and I think that they had really optimized a system of managing their drains. And so what, what happened is there was basically a, a log of anybody in the hospital who had a drain. You put in a drain, it got put on the drain board. And so every single morning, it was usually one of the PAs or if it was on the weekend, whoever was on call, whichever fellow, you would round on all of them and there was a standardized template, a worksheet basically, where you would put in the output and you'd evaluate the drain and look at it, you know, and make sure there's no pericatheter leakage, see how much it had put out and then see them every day. And then once it reached a certain point, if the output had stopped sooner than anticipated, if there was leakage from it, if the patient was getting worse clinically, if there was imaging that showed it increased in size or it was just trying to remove it, that patient would be just scheduled downstairs for a drain check and further intervention as needed. And we have to talk about this. You can also bill for that. And, you know, I mean, they're every day that they're rounding on those patients. And I'm I'm sure that it was a sizable amount of revenue that they're getting from that, but it was also very good care. And, you know, you ensured that these patients, you know, their abscesses were taken care of and you were dealing with the drain. I, you know, have gone to places after where it's like you put the drain in and 
you're pretty hands off and, you know, you got to trust your surgeon or whoever else. And where it's been a, a challenge is we recently started covering a, a new hospital, a new contract at the hospital that had never had IR before. And I would do what I was used to. I'd put the drain in and say, you're welcome. And then they'd say, well, what do we do next? Are you going to have this patient come back to clinic for the drain? And I'm like, no, absolutely not. And so, you know, it's taking a lot of education, you know, I, we have a PowerPoint where it's got like, how do you manage these drains when you take it out? And I've had a lot of FaceTime conversations with people as I'm on the phone with them, showing them, okay, you cut here and then pull here. It's been a work in progress. Absolutely. Yeah. The patients are always kind of anxious about it too, right? I mean, what do you what do you say to them? I mean, I've had patients who have requested general anesthesia for a drain pool and you kind of got to talk them off the cliff a little bit. But wh what do you do in those cases, John? Yeah, I mean, those are rare. And typically those types of patients are highly anxious patients that you usually are aware of. I would say that I think only one time in my career, I got like general anesthesia for a drain removal in a particular case. This was... For that case, it was someone who was young, who went through a lot. They had a horrible hepatic abscess. And as you guys know, managing the hepatic abscesses are really a pain. Those drains can be in there for a very long time, and they might not adequately drain for a while, and you have to do some maneuvering and replacement and upsizing, et cetera. So she kind of was like, I need general anesthesia, and I just kind of agreed to it. I didn't even fight it. But most of the time, I hardly, rarely need contra sedation. Done that a few times. But a lot of the times, you kind of say, hey, I promise, <laughs> which you never do. It's only going to last like a second. Most of the time when you remove them and you do them well, the patients are incredibly like surprised that it only lasted about a split totally. second, you know, and from removal. So you brought up a good point with the liver. That's where I think you have to be especially careful with placement and removal because you can get the cheese slicer effect, right? And so when you take pull them out of a liver abscess, do you remove them over a wire to help straighten them out? I have, it depends to the location from where I placed them. You know, admittedly, I have removed them without a wire, but half the time, <laughs> I would say most of the time I try to remove them with a wire in hepatic parenchyma. And that's any kind of organ that's developed an abscess for the most part. I try to remove under fluoro with a wire for the most part. Yeah. So I think liver and, and pancreas have challenged. And of course, I agree. You know, I mean, you know, when you take it out, I, I think it makes sense to remove the wire. I don't. But for liver and pancreas, like we frequently find ourselves in scenarios where we put in a drain and we feel like we've done a great job. And two days later, nothing's coming out. And, you know, with liver, sometimes it's just because they're small and they're just a million little locules and you're never going to get adequate drainage, even if you break it up really well with the wire. But a lot of times it's just because super thick nature of the contents and you reach a point where you can only go up so far. You know, with the pancreas, we use these big thal quick drains that would go up to like 22 French, but it's like, here, I'm going to put this fire hose in your belly. And it almost never seems to be enough. Liver, I think it's a particular challenge. I'm curious how you guys approach those. Yeah, with liver abscesses are kind of a different beast for me. You know, usually depending on how they develop and the content of them, because you could have a mix between hematoma and bile and purulence and it's and the parenchyma gets necrotic and it can be a very difficult collection to drain. It's not as simple as I would even say almost a pancreatic collection or peripancreatic collection, you know, where there's this walled off capsule and you can put a drain in there and just kind of be safe and cool with it. I've just noticed that a lot of the hepatic collections are extremely difficult to drain. There's just tons of particulate matter in there, necrotic parenchyma, purulence, you name it. And it just takes a long time to drain. And I don't really try to get so big with those. Honestly, tincture of time with hepatic abscesses are really what I require. And I, and I tell my patients about that too. I'm like, you're going to have this drain for a while. And I've noticed that sometimes the dwell time for drains in the hepatic abscesses or collections that are complex it will take months sometimes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. De depending. Speaking of liver abscesses, have you guys ever had a patient develop rigors immediately after placing a drain where they probably got bacteremic? It's kind of scary, right? It's scary for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Just, you know, have your, your opiate of choice and some fluids available and just have your residents and fellows freak out a little bit about it. And, and then, uh, you know, usually <laughs> like, you know, a little Demerol and some fluids, maybe some Tylenol, depending if- I haven't tried Demerol. It's a, it's a, I've read it, but it, you know, it's a good idea. Yeah. So look, <laughs> I could spend another hour talking about drains, but if I do, I'm going to get fired from back table. I will tell you the 
when you get a request for a dream, what is the one that every time makes you say, it's like, shit. For me, it's like post-op spine collections every oh, time. Yeah. Like, when someone's like a post-op spine collection is like, damn it. And so, yeah, and I still do them because it's the job. What about you guys? You know, that's a good one. I'll have to think about it. Maybe let Aaron answer while I, I think because that's a, that's one that I get super frustrated about all the time. I, I look at it and yeah, I go, come I get on, man. get them all the time. Yeah, yeah we get them all the time. I mean, I don't, I, they're, they are very annoying. A lot of them end up being pretty superficial, like right under the skin. And so like half the time they fall out, you know, because you don't even have much skin to tie them down with. Because it's that post-operative skin, right? And then it just, they end up, yeah, they're, they're very frustrating. I do want to say I have a rule on those, though. I have a rule on those. Unless it's Frank Puss, you use a gravity bag only. And the reason is that sometimes this is CSF. And actually, a guy in one of my previous jobs, like, hooked one of these up. It was a diagnostic guy. Hooked his drain up. You know, it just looked like a normal post-op collection. Hooked it up to suction. And the patient like hours later, some awful symptoms and they imaged it and basically sucked all the CSF out of the spine because it was just like a huge leak. And so just our listeners out there, don't do that. But one thing I want to talk about, John, and one of the reasons we brought you on here is that this is something you have, have really spent a lot of time on to learn ways to optimize. I mean, there are obviously a lot of deficiencies in the drains that we have. And, and like you said, not a lot of standardization. I want to hear first, what are the things that you're trying to correct? What are you making? What are you working on to help do this job better? You know, it's an interesting thing to talk about some of this stuff over a podcast as well. I've thought about ideally what my ideal drain would be and my ideal drainage system and also for my patients what their ideal drainage system would look like. Also for the home health care people taking care of the drains and also for the nursing upstairs taking care of the drains and then the residents and the fellows and the other specialists also taking care of the drains. So, you know, I have some things that are patent pending and it has to do a lot with the connections in the system in general. A lot of the stuff that kind of exists today is kind of path dependent. So for the last 20 years, all these different drainage companies have maybe tweaked a, like a, maybe a locking mechanism for their suture lock or something that is very small. But when I say path dependent, meaning that it's a standardized system of connections and no one's really evolved from that. And, and I get it, right? Because people are trying to profit, manufacturers are trying to profit and manufacturers also have their own tooling for these things. But we've definitely touched and evolved on a lot of different medical devices for a lot of different procedures. And a lot of them honestly aren't as much as the drains that we place. And, you know, this is for an inpatient setting for the most part, right? Like a lot of OBLs and stuff are not going to be using this, but it's super important for my setting and y'all setting. So there's different concepts that I've designed into this ideal drainage system that I have all the way from the, the tip of the drain through the connections and then uh, actually to the receptacle as well. And, you know, it's, it's about finding the right business partners, commercialization partners, and then trying to find those in industry who would like to partner up as well and push forward in manufacturing. Without giving away too much, John, can you kind of give us a clue, a hint of like how it's an improvement on what we've been doing for decades now? Yeah. So let's just say that dwell times are an issue. And so there's certain concepts that I have looked at in some of my research with my residents and then also and looking at literature as well, where we've touched on these things as far as viscosity and the need for certain drain size to deal with different types of collections. And also, I'm sure that you all have kind of observed when you place the drain, that's not the end of it. Literally, it's not the end of it. There's other components that you fumble with that exist in separate to the actual drain and drain manufacturer that you're probably using. And these components are absolutely not ideal, whether or not it be in the connection or it be with the receptacles. And so there's this whole thing where I'm trying to create an entire system that would be easy for us to use, better for the hospitals, better for the patients, and better for those who maintain them. Yes, dude. Every single one of those little, look, I totally agree with you. you know, one of the things I've noticed is that you're right. You know, so going from start to finish, from 
getting a patient on the table to hooking that drain up has probably 20 steps, right? From getting in a needle to get in them out the door, let's say 20 steps. And each one of those steps has a way that you can screw it up. In the last two weeks, I've seen somebody transfer from another hospital where the stiffener was left in place. I had another one where I put in, where I hook it up. And then so, you know, I put the drain in, suture it in, and then the text will hook it up to the JP bulb. I had one where somebody called, but this drain hasn't put anything out. It said they had forgotten to turn the stopcock. There's somewhere you can screw up every single step of this drain. I have tended to be quiet about what I've been doing about my drain designs, not only for you know the patent purposes and what I would like to do as far as finding partner for manufacturing, but also because I've been doing some research in the background as well and, and trying to really determine viscosities, drain size, dwell times, really trying to get specific with what we do for drainage. And so I really have been keeping this in my back pocket for years and decided to act on it after really getting a lot of the data myself and anecdotally also figuring out some of these things with uh, my practices. So yeah. We appreciate you uh, sharing that and look really looking forward to seeing what innovations you're going to bring to it. It reminds me of, you know how with the JP bulb, every time you got to cut it, and then you got to stretch it so that it'll fit. The tubing will fit on the JP bulb. I mean, we've been doing that for like 20 years now, right? I, I mean, I, I know for a long time because my mentors trained me how to do it and we're still doing it. And it's it's one of those things like, yeah, there's so many different connections that can go wrong. Uh-huh. Exactly. The whole thing needs to be streamlined. A lot of choke yeah. points. Yes. Just, you exactly. know, it, definitely one of the complaints I have and something to potentially be eliminated in, you know, my ideal dream and drainage system. And in that regard too, I know that Mike was saying about the thals. if you want to use a big drain, you don't really have a lot of options. You know, when your surgeons go, hey, the 16 French, you know, is not working anymore. And now you're out of luck because you can't use your lure lock connection mechanism. And I dread placing thals simply because I hate the lighthouse and Christmas tree connections, which have to be taped there, nothing is is reasonable when you place these things and you have these connections and then people complain on the floor. They ask for all these different types of connections, you know, options, et cetera. So, you know, it, it is definitely a frustrating thing because you're either stuck with a lure lock or you're stuck with a lighthouse and Christmas tree type apparatus. And I don't believe neither of them are, I mean, in certain circumstances, sure, they work well. I'll give it that for small drainage. For sure. But there's definitely some issues when we try to upsize. Michael, I think that's all we got, right? On Apps of Strangers for tonight. I just got called in for a stroke <laughs> uh, right this very moment. And, right. you know, I want to say that that time is drain, but time is brain. Nice. Uh, did you like that? Dude, I, like that. <laughs> I just came up I with that, that right now. I'm really proud of it. <laughs> I feel like I need to, to make a t shirt. Uh, time is drain. You should time is that, drain. John. Yeah. Go big and go home. Time is, time is drain. Go big and go. Yeah. Oh, man. I love that's it. good. I, right. It looks like you found Aaron, a new business just, partner. Uh, just Aaron, tell me where those the you know the fabric for those t shirts <laughs> exist. And I yes. will put that on Some there. Some Bella canvas. <laughs> oh, yeah. God. That's yeah. right. Sweet, sweet soft. But, John, thank you. And I, I want to thank our listeners. And look, I, I do want to say, like, you know, I, I make a lot of jokes about drains and everybody likes to talk down about drains, but I actually really do believe in the importance of doing drains. I mean, somebody that can do a drain well and can take the drain that, because anybody can do a basic one, but there are the upper levels of drains, the top 10% of drains. And I think that those make an incredible difference in patient care for surgeons. And it can make you a really valuable person to your surgeon and to your hospital. And that's something that, you know, being good at training, something I really pride myself on. And for our listeners out there that may not think this is glamorous, it's still important work. Well, Mike, you know, I just, just to close, I poke, I, I poke fun at this, this, you know, you, you said that Oink Medical is my company. And, you know, just to drop a hint, you know, the name of my drainage system is the big pig. So I, I'm, I'm having fun yes. with it because it's supposed to be right. It, it doesn't have to be that serious it. or glamorous, but it's necessary. So who was it? Was it John? Was it was it you that posted the hematoma that was cleared out with the thrombectomy device? Yes, uh, I was think I you? I think I retweeted that, but uh, definitely oh, okay. have, chick. have tried chick. that out. Yeah, Aaron definitely have tried it out a few times. In fact, you know, if we have just a little bit of time, I just recently did with my interventional cardiologist. We did a large pericardial hematoma, which we aspirated with large catheters, 
and got rid of some of the large hematoma and then placed a, a large drain after that as well in the through the pericardial window, which was something very unique. I haven't tweeted it, but I don't know what happened to the well, patient, I mean, so hey, I haven't it, tweeted it. <laughs> well, if it avoids surgery, then there's that, right? I mean, I think a chick or who you know, chick posted it, got a lot of people gave him a lot of shit for it because of the expense of the device, right? But if it's saving the patient going to the OR, it might actually be a benefit, right? Even cost wise. So especially in certain cases, right? This is something that we've looked into. And so we're trying to figure out and, you know, this comes to the back table innovation and, you know, how I've learned through the podcast, right? How revenue is really important. And when you're creating something or designing a device, you know, how you're going to apply that and market that and what it means. And so we're trying to look into that as far as, you know, when you do something actively, is it different from passive? Can you bill for it differently? Surgeons are doing something called YATS, which is different from VATS. I just heard about this and they're using yank hours and they're just actively aspirating with the yank hour when there's these hematomas in the pleural space and all this other stuff instead of doing a VATS. So I don't know how they're billing for it necessarily for that particular purpose, but we are looking into different things on how you can bill for doing something like that. Because if you can get rid of some, if you could prevent a surgery and you can get rid of collections in a timely manner without leaving something in for a prolonged period of time, et cetera, it could be, could be worth it. Yeah, totally. Well, John, thanks for plugging the innovation show there. That's a good place to fun <laughs> to finish up. If anybody doesn't know what we're talking about, we do at Backtable does have a med tech innovation show also can be found at backtable.com. Appreciate you coming on the show, John. Uh, it was a long time coming. I know you and I spoke several months ago and I'm glad we were able to get you on the show. Look forward to having you on the med tech innovation show in the near future. Yeah, I can't wait. I uh, really do appreciate it too. It's been really fun. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson, Josh McWhorter, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.